Jose. And we're your token theater friends, bringing a POC perspective to the performing arts. We had a bit of a snafu today because as you can maybe see, it's snowing outside. So what that means is one, we can't go into the office to record. So that's why we're in Jose's apartment. And two, we were supposed to see one of the shows today and we could not see it because once again, it's snowing outside. And it's quite uptown in Astoria. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so today we will be pitting two shows against each other, WWE style. What are they, Jose? Escape to Margaritaville, which recently opened on Broadway, and Amy and the Orphans at Roundabout Theatre Company. In Escape to Margaritaville, a type A scientist leaves the city to go to a tropical paradise where she's wooed by a Matthew McConaughey type who spends all day long wooing women and singing. The musical is essentially a Jimmy Buffett jukebox thing, so the plot is irrelevant. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the receptacle of the show is for Jimmy Buffett songs and an escape and uh, excuse to have margaritas for Three hours. First of all, like we were not familiar with Jimmy Buffett's no, music at all. No, no, because Jimmy Buffett, his music is like leisure vacation music, but for old white people who go on cruises. And I was so surprised, for instance, to realize that Jimmy Buffett didn't write the Pina Colada song. Were you surprised as I was by how pleasant the musical was. It was very pleasant and maybe it was because I was two margaritas in <laughs> but I mean I, I, I didn't hate it. I, I put it on the same spectrum as Mamma Mia. Like a big problem for me though and this is just like what I bring into it is because I come from a country that's commonly used by white people for vacations and so if you ever go to an island resort in in the middle of the ocean, there's not that many white people working there. And so I feel like it could have the people who actually worked at that resort could have been more diverse. There's something that I really think we should discuss. And what? it's a few episodes ago how we talked about how white people make people of color feel at the theater. And the way that white people were acting at Escape to Margaritaville <laughs> was <laughs> Have you ever seen them act like that? Oh my god! I, I think at one point I leaned over to you and whispered, Get out! Because they were all singing the title song, Margaritaville. Like they all knew the lyrics to this, and we were just sitting there thinking, What is happening? White people don't act like this in public. But. And they should! Exactly. They should! Yeah. I think all white people who go to escape to Margaritaville and subject people of color to their, you know, humming and like dancing along, they mm -hmm. were like even like waving their arms. Yes! And, and like, I think someone like, and yelling sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So... So like, if you're a white person and if you go to escape to Margaritaville, you are not allowed to shush any person of color ever again when nope. you go to the theater. Like, nope. ever. So an Amy and the Orphans, a brother and a sister, come home to Long Island for their dad's funeral and they pick up, and on the way they pick up their sister Amy from the assisted home that she's living in. Amy has Down syndrome and she has never lived with the family. She was um, given away to the state at a very young age because her parents could not raise a, ch a child with Down syndrome. These two siblings, they pick up Amy and they go on a road trip back home and in the process, like in the manner of all great American dramas, secrets are revealed, healing happens, and there, there is a question of what is a family? And is a family the people that you're born with or is a family that the people that you chose? So I really like this because, for one thing, the the lead actress, Jamie Brewer, she has Down syndrome. And I think this is like the first time off Broadway that there has been a lead actor with Down syndrome. And the thing is, like, there was this interesting interplay the entire time where 
the care Amy's brother and brother and sisters, they would try to talk down to her like she was a small child and try to talk to her like, you know, people on TV talk to people with a developmental disability. And you but then you could see in Jamie Brewer's performance that Amy is a lot smarter and more perceptive than she is able to verbalize. I felt that there were at least three plays within this play. Mm. And I mean, I would have been happier, to be honest, if the play had just been Amy. Because we don't really need to hear that much <laughs> about her siblings, who really, as characters, weren't that compelling to me. Yeah, the, I, I agree, because Deborah Monk who plays Maggie and Mark Bloom who plays Jacob, Amy's brothers and sisters, like they are talking the entire time. Like they take up so much space because they are so loud. And I, I, saw, I saw what player Lizzie Farentino was doing there, which was just to contrast them mm. with Amy. But I do agree that like giving a little bit more space for Amy to speak, I think would have made for a more powerful piece. So. I don't know, a lot to talk about, which is why I think you should see this play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, 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 this, in this battle, I think I, I would pick Amy and the Orphans. I'm gonna go with Amy too. Like, yeah. you're gonna get more... You're gonna be thinking about what you saw longer. Mm -hmm. You're not just gonna go home with a hangover. Yeah. You might know Andre Holland from his work as an actor. You've probably seen him in Moonlight and A Wrinkle in Time and also on stage in Jitney. But did you know that he's also a stage director? What? Yep. What? Why is he at the time? <laughs> Andre is directing Dutch Masters. So we went ahead and talked to him. So let's check it out. This show is not about Vermeer or Rembrandt. So, <laughs> <laughs> what is Dutch Masters about? Oh, that, that, nice introduction. <laughs> um, Dutch Masters uh, is a play written by Greg Keller, and it is about mm -hmm. these two young men who in 1992 meet each other on a New York City subway car. Uh, and throughout the course of this afternoon that they spend together, uh, they unlock all of these secrets about their mm -hmm. lives, and they discover that they actually had a really um, complicated and beautiful and intense connection from long ago that they had sort of uh, forgotten about. This is your directorial debut? It is. I, uh, I directed a film, a short film last mm. year, so that was my um, first sort of, uh, my official directorial debut. And then I've directed a lot of um, one acts and, and scene work and things like that, but in terms of like a full-on professional production, yeah, this is my first one and I'm grateful for it. So when you get this script, mm -hmm. Where do you go? I have to direct this. Greg and I went to graduate school together. The oh, writer, wow. yeah, mm -hmm. we went to NYU together, uh, both as actors. And he first let me read this play back in probably 2005. Mm -hmm. I read it and loved it right away. Um, I mean, the, the two characters I think are so beautifully drawn and so complex um, that as an actor, I wanted to play, frankly, I wanted to play one of the parts. <laughs> Now I'm a little too old for it. They play like the coolest principal of all time, I think, in A Wrinkle in Time, <laughs> and which is obviously a family movie, and it's meant for you know young audiences. Mm -hmm. Moonlight also has very young uh, characters at its center, mm -hmm. and Dutch Masters is about two teenagers. Mm -hmm. So why is it important for you to create art that lets young people of color know, you know, like, hey, we are telling your stories. You're welcome to the movies. You're welcome to the theater. Come see yourselves. For me, growing up, um, I did, you know, I loved theater from a pretty young age, but I never, I rarely ever went to see plays that had people on stage who looked like me or sounded like me. And so when I became an actor, a large part of my struggle was trying to figure out where and how I fit into the world of the American theater. I remember when I was in, in college even, I started to develop this love for Shakespeare. And I remember people would say to me, when I told them I liked Shakespeare, they'd say, oh, you? You must, you know, you must be really excited to play Othello one day, <laughs> or to play Aaron the Moor one day. Like unspoken canon of mm -hmm. like parts that people, that men of color play. Mm -hmm. The Horatios, mm -hmm. the Laertes, sometimes yeah. the like, you know what I mean? There's like a, a, a like canon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I always took great offense to that. At that, you know, and I think 
that's partly due to the fact that when we go see plays, we often don't see people of color in, in prominent parts. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, if I'm going to do something uh, on stage, either as an actor or as a director, I want to put people on stage who maybe we don't get to see all the time. When did you first see yourself on stage? Hmm. Good question. I know in the first moment that I like really saw in like a profound way was there was a production of Hamlet that Peter Brook directed at Chicago Shakespeare Theater back in like 2000. Oh man, it might have been like 2001 or 2002. <laughs> I had just come out of college. And I was home in Alabama for a weekend and my mother opened the newspaper and there was, you know, on the, on the like art section there's mm -hmm. that little insert. On the cover of the, the art section, there was a picture of this black man with dreads holding Yorick's skull. And she handed it to me. She was like, what do you think about this? And at that point, I had, I had never even entertained the idea, the notion that a black person could play Hamlet. Now, today mm -hmm. that sounds ridiculous, but at the time, it was out of, it was just, mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine mm -hmm. it. And I looked at it and she said, well, you know, do you want to go and see it? Turned out it was closing the next day. And so she like, she and my dad got a little bit of money together, rented me a car, and I took off driving from Alabama to Chicago the next morning. I got there, stood in line, got the last cancellation, you know, got a single seat, sat in the balcony, and watched Adrian Lester walk out on stage and play Hamlet, and I just wept and wept and wept. Mm -hmm. It was, I just never knew that such a thing was possible, you know. For today's 11 o'clock number, <sighs> We are gonna be talking about the way in which white critics refuse to make space for people of color to come into the business. So this was inspired by the announcement that there's going to be a new New York Theatre Review website. And it's founded by five Broadway critics. And guess what, Jose? Surprise! They're all white people and four of them are men. Get out of here. What? Not, I mean, uh, not to diss these critics' work, because we read them, and they're our colleagues, and we respect them. When, when editors talk about wanting to get more people to read theater coverage, or to bring in new voices in theater reviewing, a bunch of gay, white, old men sitting in a room talking about Broadway shows. Is that new, Jose? No, that's, that's Broadway. Yeah, that's Broadway right now. The more different people talk about the work, the better the conversation around the work will be, and the more different people will come see the work. If you're a white journalist and you're watching this, stop rolling your eyes and ask, have I done enough to bring new voices into this profession? Have I done enough to ensure that this profession will be alive? once I'm gone or once I retire. And we would also love to hear from theater makers of color. If you're a playwright of color, if you're a director of color, please reach out to us on Twitter and let us know how many times have critics of color written about your work? What do you think gets lost in the process of not having those voices write mm -hmm. about your work? We would love to hear from all of you. Yeah. And we would love to hear from young writers of color or any young writers who want to write about theater, we can mentor. And that is it for our show for today. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. That way you get notifications when we put out new token videos. Or like American Theater Magazine on Facebook. We put our videos on Facebook too. And as always, I'm Dee. And I'm Jose, Team Changela till the end. <laughs> We're your token theater friends. Bye. Bye. Still learning to be honest with mm. you. I'm still learning. It's a <laughs> it's a deep subject like that. <laughs> <laughs>